Carrie. Hey, Sandra. Who are we? I think it's your turn today. The screaming devils. In Madrid. In the woods. In, in Madrid. In Madrid. In the woods. Okay. Who'd we interview? We okay. You say one. I'll say the other. Who'd we interview today? Oh, you're asking. Oh. <laughs> Oh my gosh, girl, it's been a long day. Okay. Oh my gosh, we have two people on the divas today. And yes. the first one is Patricia Reset, Pat Reset. Yeah, people, holy moly. Soprano. Soprano extraordinaire. And the second one is her amazing partner in crime, in life, and everything gorgeous, mezzo, soprano, Beth Clayton. We had my coach as well now. And I mean, they've both both started as full-time 100% singers and they both now have branched out into different aspects of the opera business and are just blossoming, both of them. Well, still, you know, still singing, but they have so much to offer to this business. Don't you think, Carrie? I mean, come on. I mean, Beth Clayton is now a health, mental health professional. She is working with uh, young artists all over the United States, not only just young artists, but artists in general. I really love um, her path and why she did this and how this all really helped tremendously so many people during the pandemic. And then we have Patricia Reset, Pat, who we call Pat, who not only is this American opera great diva soprano. She's a director and now the artistic director of the Young Artist Program at Opera Theater of St. Louis. I mean, amazing people. How amazing is this? Um, helping mold young singers into full-fledged, full career singers. So and teaching voice and directing operas as well. I mean, how many hats does she wear? Crazy. And, and, and I'm sorry, I feel like we need a part two, Sandra, because there were even like half these questions that we had, we didn't even ask, but we, this is a fun, 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 super fun conversation. And we hope you all enjoy this. Yep. Check out the clip. <laughs> awesome people, people. I say people a lot. <laughs> you say people a lot, but you know what? People love it. There, I said it for you too, Carrie. So love you all. Stay safe, stay well. Bye. The over-prioritization is what I'm noticing in working with people, even with con in conservatories and young artist program is yes, we have to command the technique. We have to command the voice, but the over-prioritization of that is leaving free the interpretive, the nurturing and fostering of the interpretive process. It leaves out the possibility for attaching individuality to it. It leaves out the possibility of finding these solutions. People are not rehearsing performance. They're rehearsing the voice. They're rehe and it's just, it's in my opinion, it's a little too late to rehearse the performance of what it is to be an artist once yeah. you're in the room with the conductor that, and the director. That's and all even like what we're talking about though. And in my, in the, in the work I like to do in the work, that, you know, I think we all, it sort of becomes a collective. Right. It's about allowing that fluidity. I mean, think about if, if our joints work, we still have synovial fluid in them. You know, if most our joints them, get, yes, most, most of them, them most some of us are, you know, <laughs> But, some of us are a little older, you know, so they're a little creepy sometimes, but you want that fluidity. If we've become so tight with all the requirements, all the prioritization you're saying of all the things that are necessary, mm -hmm. then you're squeezed out quite literally. And then when you start to feel that in your mind, then your voice follows, you know, and the larynx is going to grip because we know that the, we know in our, in our brains, we know that the best singing is going to happen when this is just uninvolved and just hanging out. Oh my God, two for one, two for one, two for one. We got a two for today, Carrie. You got a two for. No, we got a three for. No, we got a three for. Who is it? This is Zoe. 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 Oh my Zoe. gosh. Pina. Oh. Oh my goodness. Hello, Zoe. Hey, Hi, baby. Zoe. Oh, bring it. Are you ready? Bring it. Okay, can I also say that I'm very disappointed that I did not bring my St. Bernard up here for a cameo next to your lovely dog there. Right. She's very 
yeah, super, super glue. Yeah, super, yeah, super glue. right? Again. <laughs> well, you used to have one, what, Sappho? Yes. You. Nice memory. Yes, we did. And because we're very shy about our lesbianism. Yes, so exactly. Sappho, you know, like, just go ahead and throw it out there. There's your name. Exactly. So it's over. Oh, my God. I love that so much. So you're in Santa Fe. Yeah. In Santa Fe. Santa Fe. I know, like, seriously. Are you there full time? Is this a full time home? Yeah. yeah, for as much as full time applies, we are. And actually, this pandemic afforded us for the first time in our adult lives to be in our home for four consecutive seasons, which has never happened. Never We've happened. lived in Santa Fe for 23 Three. years, and we built Press. this place about 10 and a half years ago. Um, but it's, I, there were some serious silver linings to the pandemic. Yeah. We went fly fishing. How cool is that? Only thing I, I caught want, with myself. I want photographic evidence of that. Yeah, I want to see the outfits. That's what I want to see. see. The waiters, you know, like you do the waiters, but it, it, it gave me an excuse to go like to the Merrill outlet and buy totally waterproof shoes that were cute. Ooh, love that. <laughs> Gets the the outfits even when skiing, even though she's terrified of heights and of going fast down a slippery mountain. So she just got the cute outfit, but didn't want to actually ski. Yeah. <laughs> Wasn't that called a, a bunny, like a, a, a ski bunny? No bunny. So, so, bunny. So, so why Santa Fe? I know that you two met and, and Santa Fe has a special place for you, but I mean, Santa Fe is not easy for international travel. Right. Santa Fe is not easy for domestic travel. It's basically, <laughs> right. no matter where you're coming from with the exception of Dallas or Phoenix, it's a 10 hour door to door. For example, we went to a wedding this past weekend in Napa. It's not that much, short flights. It, it, was, it was 10 hour in transit. You know, we're taking into consideration check-in time, blah, 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 transportation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's an hour to, to, from Santa Fe to the airport, isn't it? Well, there's an, there's airport, an airport in Santa, in Santa Fe. Fe. It's about as big as our laptop. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's, you can get flights to, to Dallas. You used to be able to get flights to Phoenix. I don't know if in they're LA. in LA and all that stuff. So we've used that from time to time, but why Santa Fe? I, I think, I mean, we, we fell in love with it individually. And then we fell in love literally with each other. Mm -hmm. during the, in 1997 but I was an apprentice here in 95 and I fell in love with it yeah. you did here in 96 I was supposed to do a second year of apprenticeship but I got wrangled into something in Houston and I couldn't which was fate because we weren't supposed to meet in 96 we were supposed to meet in 97 yeah. when I was hired back to work here and, and they so all said it was a fling 24 years later I, I know I remember that I remember that I remember meeting well I think I knew somebody else's other half and I remember you two meeting in Santa Fe and I thought yep that's it that's not <laughs> you were like super glue right yeah it, it was it was it was immediate intense powerful I mean the kind of powerful it's interesting we you know we, you know we sing we perform we we ex emotionally explore constantly love and lust and all these things I found it absolutely terrifying right. and um, <laughs> perhaps the only time in my life I've never been able to eat um, <laughs> but that passed so um, but it's, it's true <laughs> it, was really intense. it was it was really but intense our teacher you know we, we both studied with uh, Trish McCaffrey for all these years in fact I studied with her before Pat did people don't really know that but I mean my teacher fun fact that she was like whoa well what's that well well <laughs> what's going on here hey people I am Zing, zing, zing. So, so Santa Fe, even with all, even with all the travel issues and blah, 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 you said, Hey, come on, let's do it. You know, Sandra, the, the fact is, you know, you just need to have access to an airport. It, yeah. What's really important. And you, 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 you both know this very well. When you come home, you need it to be restorative. You need it to be a place that feeds your soul. And so that is more important than a little bit of inconvenience of, you know, it's just important to fly somewhere you want to go. Yeah. So yeah. you're going to fly home and you want that to be somewhere that feels good rather than, ugh, back to the grind. And I, you know, I mean, we still have our little, uh, we have an apartment in New York and this is a record. We have not been inside our apartment in two years. Whoa. Because we had it rented during the pandemic briefly for the, uh, right. for the poor mezzo who had to, you know, only do one performance of, of, of was it Ding of Holland? No. I think so. Or, I think so. Maybe I think Tonhoiser. so. But, you know, we gave her money back and let her, she, I think she actually lives in Munich, but she's, so that was a mess. And yeah. so we didn't even go in before we went to Monte Carlo. No. And so now it's been two Has years anyone been in? Have you had somebody go in and check on it? 
Okay. I mean, we have somebody go in every once in a while, you know, run a, run a load of an empty just, road of <laughs> clothes and do all the dishwashers. Nece and do all the necessaries and everything. Yeah. Carrie moved. Carrie moved from downtown Nashville to out out in the woods in the middle of the pandemic. Yeah, because I live in a state where COVID what? And the number, you know, people don't get vaccinated. They don't want to get vaccinated here. So I was actually, I love living in the city. I actually have learned that I love living out here with the lake is right on the other side of those trees. So we get out on the boat and have a great time. But um, I, I was so angry all the time. And I thought I can't be around this anymore. I need, I need to be feel like myself. So we need to find peace and serenity somewhere. That but um, like a lot of people have moved away from urban areas. I mean, I know property values really took a nosedive in New York after, you know, we had, we have friends that were in their one bedroom apartments and talk about lockdown with in no New York. Space. I mean, it's cray cray. I mean, Crazy. we adore each other, but uh, there, that would have been. Oh. Would have been tough. oh, no, we were that. I mean, I was on the road all the time. My husband works here. So we just had a one bedroom and a den in downtown Nashville. And we're looking at each other like four months into this. And I'm like, I love you, but we've been together a very long time, but we need some space. <laughs> Wait, would you call, Pat, would you call yourself a singing actress? Yeah. Yeah. I would. I the act of singing in it of itself has no appeal to me whatsoever. No, you, you have to have, watching you rehearse, it's really fascinating. And people out there that have not been able to experience that, you really come at it from a completely different way than most singers. Can we talk about that a little bit? Yeah, for me, my best singing happens when I'm utterly and totally immersed in the interpretive experience, in the in the drama of whatever that person, that circumstance is. And and I pride myself in every role I sing, and which is why I do that when it's a role that because I, I can't find enough in it that I can bite into that I can sink my teeth into I pride myself in fleshing out as to the best of my ability every single role so that somehow some way it doesn't need to match anything about me my temperament or my experiences but somehow it siphons through all of my fibers to be attached to something real three-dimensional and visceral and that that for me is is key otherwise if I ever have the feeling where that's kind of what I didn't like about Trovatore. I was too aware that I well, was singing. She's a bit of a drip too. I'm sorry. She's a bit. I, yeah, a, a little bit. I mean, just, and it, so if I, if I ever had the feeling like I got just my, the only experience I was having and that I felt like I was offering was in the singing, it just, it just loses the appeal, loses the, the connection to my artistic mm -hmm. being. So it's, it's, it's key for me. Right. And it shows. Mm -hmm. really a show like so what would be your favorite role that you've done tabarro pagliacci oh i love doing Medza. i actually i loved doing tosca because she's she gets to be so temperamental and after so much so much of the repertoire and characters i've played um act two tosca, would be act like two tosca that's like mm -hmm. susanna your susanna was amazing too oh thank you thank no, you no i mean it's 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 really i looked at you singing uh Susanna when I did it the first time because I thought you know I think it in Chicago like in 2000 or something like that I don't know I think so yeah. my membership is not here he's you know, I'm, I'm actually I can't say where because the season hasn't been announced I don't believe I'm directing Susanna soon so um you know I'm directing now too right yeah. well that, that was I mean okay That's you're fantastic. my favorite new role it's I never have been successful at picking a favorite role I love um my newest acquisition is Kostelnitschka. Oh, After doing so many Yenufas to finally get to do the Kostelnitschka is just like talk about cool something to sink your teeth into. Meaty, and meaty, meaty. Complicated and it's just well, that I think the last time I met you, you were learning Zalme. Yes. Oh, I, I like Zalme too. Because Beth I, was Beth was like, okay, come on, Pat, we got to go work. <laughs> right you're like Whoosh. yeah you know what that's a role once you've learned it you know it because it's it's so it, it no, it's so complicated is also just got, it's got so much math in it yeah yeah in terms of even just the hardcore fundamental it, learning yeah, of it. yeah really. absolutely absolutely it's, it's true i mean oof. but my very favorite role is costal nichka 
um, Zalame, Tosca, and I suppose we should throw a butterfly in there for good. <laughs> oh, oh, you just, that just made me remind me of something. When I was first tearing apart butterfly uh, through out of your mouth came through like two other people to me that whenever you talked about butterfly, it was like, make sure you have those strong thighs because you got to be able to get up beautifully without putting your hand down on the ground. I mean, you have to be able to do it. So I did it. Thanks to you. I got some strong, fabulous, juicy, thick thighs, but I got up, girl, without touching the ground. You want to do that. And that's, everyone says, do you need knee pads? My, I never wore knee pads no. in my life. It's your, your legs that you have to just because, and also you're having to economize your physicality and take these tiny steps. And so, I mean, it's, it's the best butt clenching role you can think of. And it's Thank just to really energize your legs in order to have that sort of economical yeah. kind of physicality. Well, and how, how cool is it that you actually shared that information and it got passed around? We don't really need know each other, but I heard that and I took that to heart because you're saying butterfly all over the world. I knew you knew what you were talking about. <laughs> Beth, how many Suzuki's did you do? Zero. Beth has never no. done. She's like the, you're like the Carmen queen. No, I'm way too tall for Suzuki. <laughs> I'm I too tall. about me. spending the night on your knees. I would be like, you know, like no, thank you. No. <laughs> You'd be no. taller than the kid, right? <laughs> you crossed your path professionally, has it? No, I mean, early on, I remember it was kind of like joked about, but I mean, if you're six feet tall, you just don't do that. Not unless yet. you have, I mean, you know, I could have done it, I guess, in the Robert Wilson production. Yeah. Or not. Yeah. We're, we're not. Here's your death. Here's the death. Wait. Oh. I remember Christine Gerke doing, doing <laughs> Lohengrin, <laughs> Lohengrin at the Met, and I watched some of the rehearsals, and all I heard was, so schnell, so schnell. Okay. <laughs> now, for me, I mean, when I was uh, in the studio in Houston, we had to do Four Saints and Three Acts, and we all were like, you know, slave labored into that. And, and it's things like you remember, well, what was number 278B? And you knew there was something wrong with you if you remembered what that was. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. Go back to 33-1A. Yeah, oh wait, oh wait. I'm catalog? Yeah. There's just so many gestures. It was such you a- You are scaring me because I'm supposed to do that turn dot now. I'm like, nah. Oh, run. I just remember him grabbing all the backs of our heads, you know, and puppeteering us up, you know, to have that string. But, you know, I had some, I had some good ass posture in that. <laughs> I bet you positive do. side, positive side. You have good books to write, you know? <laughs> you know? That's what I always say. We have good books to write. So what's what's been so far? Because I think we're all we're all Carrie's probably the youngest of all of us, but we're all around the same age. What's been the most rewarding for both of you? What's been the most rewarding and the worst part of your careers thus far? Hmm. Hmm. I know it's a good question, isn't it? I don't know what I would say. What's been the most rewarding and the worst part? Yeah, like the most rewarding and the hardest part. Let's say that. I don't know this about me. I love cooking. I love being home. I, I just, it's, it's the, the hardship of this profession has been the transient nature, nature of it. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the, the desire to be home and in your own nest and constantly, constantly, especially during my busiest years being uprooted so often, I found, I found that to be a real hardship. A real hardship yeah. and um the best part gosh i'm happy to say it'd be hard to the applause the applause <laughs> the curtain calls no going home no but just the immense privilege um of being able to share your commentary about what it is to be on this earth and 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 how this opulent complicated incredible art form affords such expression in that and the, the, the to be a player in that has been that's been the best part it's been uh -huh. kind of and there's well, there's one common there's one common moment that happened um because we had already been together 10 years i guess because i think it was in 2008 and it was the first time that our schedules had coincided that, that we were both in New York at the same time singing. Mm -hmm. And Pat was doing Butterfly at the Met and I was doing Carmen at New York City Opera for a really wow. long run. Mm -hmm. And I remember walking to rehearsal together once or twice. No, we did or meeting, a couple times. meeting for lunch, meeting like for our lunch. schedule. Yeah. 
And then when wow. Oprah came out, we were reviewed side by side. On one page, you were my review on the other page. Oh, that's great. And they were both, and they were both favorable. It wasn't like, so, yeah. <laughs> so, I like. Now I have pulled out and I've meant to, um, I don't like to frame to, everything, no, but, but we wanted to I wanted frame to frame the that. Position. That'd be cool. Stop, stop singing. Yeah. But there was also another moment that we can share that's a full circle for me because a thousand years ago when I was starting to sing about this, you know, Son or you and I are, I think, at the same age because we were in the Met competition together, except one of us won and one of us didn't. <laughs> which was which? But anyway, I think, I think she's, she's sitting in the screen below. Um, <laughs> we're just pace pace. Yeah. I remember. I remember. Sorry. Delightful. Sorry. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> but, but we had, I was, I was covering, they were doing one of those live from Lincoln Center projects that they used to do on, on the PBS, on the TV. Yeah, yes. Uh, and I, was, I was covering everything that Flicka and Jackie were singing. And then it was, I mean, Renee was doing it, Sam Raimi was doing it, Elizabeth Futrell. And so it was like, you know, people, some in there earlier and some in the just major prime, some thing. But Renee decided that Charlotte and Weekend in the Country and Little Night Music was too low for her. So I got to do it. And so I got to be on the show and be in the, in the big, you know, in the big number. And Sam Raimi was my husband and all these things. Wow. It's all these years later, like 25 years later, um, I'm coming out of retirement to sing Charlotte um, and Pat will be singing Desiree for the for Arizona Opera's 50th anniversary. And so it's gonna be it's just one of those like full circle moments. <laughs> hey Edison, I'm learning Macbeth right now and La Luce Langue. I'm right now at La Luce Langue and I'm going, nope, nope. <laughs> <laughs> it's too low. But you guys did okay. Remember Japan? Remember Matsumoto? How can, oh, thank you for oh. waiting. Thank you for waiting. Remember every time we, you know, we had a schedule, we had to get a rehearsal and we'd go for breakfast. And thank you for waiting and wait, we did. Um, <laughs> Remember when we yelled at that? <laughs> that means, that means, uh -huh. very, very, you say sumimasen, that means like, hey people. Yeah, we were all there. We were doing dialogues of the Carmelites. Right. Love right. it. That's right. With Gerky was there. Joyce, Joyce, Joyce was there. Is Joyce there. was my cover. Jessica Zambello production. Sheila. <laughs> okay, I've got a funny Sheila story. So you know how um, they would always say, yes, please, hi, dozo. Hi, so every time dozo. you got in the cab and everything, so we, you know, the three of us piled in a cab, hi, dozo, hi, dozo, hi, dozo. We're in the cab, we're buckling up. Sheila's in the front seat. She looks very slowly over to the driver and she goes, hi, dozo. <laughs> <laughs> Carrie, this is this is Sheila Nadler, and she is she is just about the one of a kind. She's one of a kind. And I'll never forget a late night in her hotel room um, at the Buena Vista, um, where Sergio Zawa is king. Uh, she was. We had to provide for her some fresca, and maybe there might have been an added other ingredient. <laughs> we were treated to a non pimesta about a fifth down from its original key she's at about 10 30 11 at night i think we, we were asked to leave the hotel the hotel <laughs> she she was just she's just such a character and such a colorful wonderful yeah. person that's you know that's also a thing the people you meet totally. they, you know, where uh, my manager early on said you know look you're performers you're entertainers you're you're interesting people so th that meeting all these um you know different personalities uh, is also something that's kind of but don't you remember Sandra at the end of those performance this is another thing I've never forgotten two things one was at the end of the performance the silence before they would dare to applaud mm. felt like Mary, a have you been to Japan before oh no mm -mm. okay so, oh, no. had to bless you know a she um, a Shinto priest had to come and bless the auditorium because death and so much death right. was gonna happen on stage in every every facet of all the production team, you know, had to participate. We had to Pat represented the singers, Francesca was representing the production. But at the end, and you know, Seiji Ozawa memorized the score while we were there, so we didn't use his score. He always memorized his which he, which he does, but he hadn't done yeah. a lot of opera, let's just say. But um, he would come and when the curtain would go down and they they were just frozen for the longest time I've ever heard. And then it, it erupted was. in this applause, and then he would come up and he'd be like, ha ha, you play basketball. <laughs> Slap <laughs> <laughs> my hand as we were going in the line. But the other, the second thing I remember is 
all the all the nuns except for Sir Mathilde, which is what I was supposed to be singing, and I got upgraded to Mary Marie because we had a right. problem. Um, so it was pretty young Mary Marie, but all they were all women from the Tokyo chorus or something. Yes. And you know, just culturally, just as a cultural moment, individuation is not taught that no. much. In fact, it's discouraged. And without being directed, they came up with the most individual ways that they would walk up to the yeah. guillotine because it was in profile. Oh my God. And two of the, two, I'm gonna chill, just think about it. Oh. Because two of the original Carmelite nuns were actually sisters, were biological sisters. Oh, so these two Mary, it was, it was stunning. This production was stunning because as you go to the guillotine, Francesca Zambello wanted everybody to have their own reaction to death. And then they had like this flash of light and then the light went out and you heard and it was like oh. you, i mean the guillotine is, is written in the music i mean it's very yeah, you know, right. specified but these two women playing the sisters the first one went up to the went up to the steps and stopped mm -hmm. she turned and she ran but i could cry just like thinking about it she ran back and hugged her sister oh. and then went up to death and then when they would all as each one of them died they would all sit at the base of the slide because you had to slide yeah. down yeah. and wait. And I mean, I felt like such a jerk because Mary Marie's the one who survives. And, you know, I thought, oh, I hate it. And I missed all these ladies because I'd gotten to be really close to them while I was their, you know, leader, leader carrying around that giant cross. Remember that right. cross, yeah. Oh, good Lord. Poor Joyce, because she's not my height and not the thing, but Francesca was so attached to that image, you know, the big cross. But we would go down and, and I would just go and then join them and wait for Pat because she was going to be the last one. Right. I'll just cry. They all just sit at the base of the stairs and we'd all just cry. It was, it was just, it so I never, ever forget. Never. And they gave us all these beautiful gifts, you know, at the end. Oh. I still have them. They're just everything. Uh, that, that performance was, that's one that if, if we do write a book, that's going to be one in the book. Yeah. I'll, and and, sure. and, and uh, I should mention, you, you remember the, 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 the quite a considerable ascension on the stairs and it was a gold gilded box that you could see, remember, and the whole wall turned around to prepare for the jump, bum, 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 that whole thing. And then the door would slammed open right on that cord. And for the death, which can be very difficult to achieve uh, in terms of stagecraft, because, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's just very difficult. And yeah. what Francesca um, envisioned and realized was, like you said, there was a light. The person went up there and as soon as, as, soon as you heard the shoo, the light would go black and then you literally slid down the slide. So from the audience, you Crazy. didn't see the disappearance. You just saw the vacant box mm -hmm. once it lit back up. So it was, it, I think that I personally think that's one of her best, if not her best production ever. I really. think so. so. And you know what else I remember about that, that time? Carrie doesn't know this, I've never said this. Remember the twin beds that were put together? Okay. Put they, apart? freaking out about us because we had ours pushed together you know we're a couple so we had two rooms we couldn't get a room with a big bed we had two right. rooms right. so we'd dry all our laundry in one room we used one kind of dressing room and then we'd sit yeah. there. we would never let the maids in and every every day the maid came carrie she would they would put the beds the two twin beds together and every day the maid came she would split the two beds <laughs> back together yeah, exactly yeah. they were, like Beth said we didn't let them in the room very often and right, it's, but once, but we, once did. we did and it was just like it was like the whole group of them was down at the end of the hall and they went oh, oh, oh. Oh. <laughs> they ascended so <laughs> <laughs> so and every day you'd be like yep they did it again yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, okay yeah. i i want to segue go to beth so because there's hey because there's so much interesting stuff to talk about here. I just finished listening to your Opera America chat, um, which I would love to talk about. But first, I, with for both of you, both of you have had these amazing operatic careers and then have also transitioned into other things. I know, Pat, you're still singing. Beth, you are not. Is that correct? Or every once in a while, you're- A few you're, exceptions. A few exceptions. A few exceptions. So can we talk about, from both of you, those transitions? And for you, Beth, why you chose what you chose um, to get into and how that is working in your life now, because I want to talk about that. And then I want to ask you questions about pandemic and about the Opera America chat that I listened to. Wow, that's a lot. Okay. Oh, whatever. Okay. Where shall I begin? I know. 
Well, wait, how did the idea start? Like, was it percolating? Um, there's been a certain level of percolation over the years. I mean, I think um, I always called myself the resident therapist for pretty much every job I did because I found that I was sort of a, a problem solver, a listener, those kind of, you know, empathetic terms that come into the therapeutic realm. Um, and also, I mean, Pat said to me so many years ago, she said, I don't know if opera is enough for you. Mm. And that's, that's a specific kind of statement because, I mean, we all know how opera is phenomenal. It's amazing. I, I mean, I think it's arguably, you know, one of the richest art forms that exist because it's so multifaceted. Right. So, I mean, there's, there's that point of it, but it's like, there's also part of it that's so incredibly selfish in order to be able to do it really, 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 really well. You have to be, yeah. There's so much, there's a lot of self-centric self -centric that comes with that. And there's part of that that doesn't, it's not even me trying to be, you know, falsely humble or any of that. It, it's not that, but that didn't always appeal to me. And yeah. part of that, my other book I have to write is Mezzo Mentality, because I think there's, there's something about that that's just innately, I'm, I'm innately genetically, Ooh, genetically. That's my new genetically, word. Genetically, that's a good word. So I mean, there was there were some aspects of that, and there were some things. I mean, some things that were going great in my singing, some things that were going like in a direction I was like, eh, this is not lighting my fire the same way. I mean, yeah. to see Carmen, yeah, yeah, I could do that until I'm dead. Right. Um, I would, I would, you know, love love that lady. But there were some other aspects I was thinking, ah, I feel like I have some more things I need to say, or some more things I need mm -hmm. to do, and it just. I don't know, it kind of came to me. I also have a mentor who's a mental health professional. Mm -hmm. And I ended up going to the school that she went to, even though she went there in the 70s or the early, no, maybe in the 80s. But so all these years later, I thought I, I could do that. And it was very, very scary at first because I thought I cannot believe I'm going to slice. I'm going to stop. I'm really just going to stop. And then I'm going to go to school and do this master's. And, and most of it was online. So, I mean, I've been Zooming for several years because right. that was the platform we used before this ever happened. Right. The whole idea was that I would deliver my practice online because I mainly want to work with our people. And I mean, right. our and people, so, artists, you know, whether that's LGBTQ people too, but, but artists, you know, in general. Right. And so that was sort of the, the pre-pandemic plan that ended up being you know a useful thing but, in terms well, of absolutely especially because i feel like there are, whether artists have had to walk away from this business because financially or for whatever reasons the what the pandemic in a way made that happen but i i love that your journey was before the pandemic because there must be so much of your own personal life that can help artists in a way in in therapy sessions to process that because it's a lot of grief for those that can't for whatever reason or don't want to do it anymore. I mean, that's enormous. Yeah, and I mean, it was, it's very, I, I've said this probably in any number of interviews about it, but a big chunk of my internship, that was, that was like a major life transition because I had to stay home and I never wow. stayed home in, you wow. know, 20 years. Right. And, not, and part, you know, part of the reason for doing it was we do like to be together. We are that couple who does better, functions better, especially one of us. When we're together um, so <laughs> for me be able to travel with her and still be able to to work in a different place or even to, to do the degree so when I got to the point in the degree where I couldn't really couldn't be as transient I was working at this nonprofit um, grief counseling center wow or primarily for grieving children okay but it's also for youth and adults and so okay. there was so much light shown on you know what is grief? What does it look like? How do we, how do we process that? And how many different forms there are mm -hmm. of it? And it's certainly not, you know, it's not restricted to death. You know, there's just so much grief in life. And yeah. I you always use the phrase, we have to find the vitality of grief. Yeah. Because we have to, you know, we have to live through that. And we, we're the ones who, I mean, you, you know, think of all the pregnant singers out there. There's so much grief during pregnancy because you're going to lose part of your range for a little while. Yeah, or the yeah. color of your voice may change because your hormones are shifting. So, I mean, there's grief in that. You may, your favorite role may be one where, oh my gosh, I've lost that extension. I can't do that anymore. Yeah. What about menopause? I mean, seriously. Menopause, forever, you know. Yeah, but HRT! <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and, and for all that, I don't mean to make it, you know, female exclusive. I mean, for, yeah. for these same yeah. things apply to, to males and right. these same things apply to... Well, they don't to, have the same hormonal not the same hormonal thing, but nose dive of, so don't even try and... Yeah, exactly. Say, no, but also just longevity. Tenors who, you know, 
Yeah, of course. Tenors and sopranos who use their voices in such a specific way. Extremes. In, in, to the extremes of it. So, I mean, just understanding like the tax taxation on the on the physical. Stage fright. I mean, that's a huge issue. What did you say? Stage um, fright. Stage fright in, in the way people process. It's it's really interesting. And some people, their, their function is, I mean, they're the most gregarious people you can even ever imagine talking to in life. And then they just go into a shell. And then there's the opposite. The people who really would rather never be interviewed. Please don't talk to me about it. But if they get on stage, you go, you know. It's like Dimitri, Dimitri of Odostovsky, he was one like that. Yeah. Hated interviews, got on stage, was an animal. Yeah, you know? yeah, so, electrifying. So, I mean, there, there's, there's just so much. I mean, that's kind of an endless, it's an interminable conversation in a good way. I, I think I, I feel like there's some there's so many conversations I've had with um, friends lately, colleague friends, um, real actually, sorry, I want to say close dear friends that uh, that are other singers um, that it's been really difficult to sit in a space when you're not working. And there are more Americans, I think, that haven't been working than there were European singers. But overall, I mean, it's a devastation of loss of work, identity, whatever it is. And um, I love that you had said in this Opera America interview that when someone asks you, how are you, it is okay to say, I'm not fine, that it's shit, that it's like we are, it's okay to say that, and it's okay to sit in that. And, but I love that you said, find your time yourself to sit in those shitty feelings and shit, um, sit in those shitty moments for however one, two, three minutes, but then also find this, the opposite of that, the yin and yang of that, of serenity, of finding this place where, and what resonated with me was where your mind can breathe because there is like, that is so immense and so huge. And, um, I, for those that have not had the opportunity to work, for those that are trying to figure out in their lives, am I going to walk this path of still trying to be an opera singer or if I'm going to do something completely different? Um, I just, those gems that are on the internet and things that people like you are saying out there is tremendous. And it's yeah, helpful. We'll put that up with this interview because I think it's really important that people have that, those references and that vocabulary because, you know, listen, it's, it's hard to differentiate and Carrie and I, we talk about this a lot because we're best of friends, your personality from your voice. Mm. And when you've lost your voice for a year and a half, how does that affect your personality? And that's the have... uniqueness of our genre, of this right. genre, because I don't right. know how many times I've said, you know, oh my gosh, there've been so many times I wanted to take these out of my throat, put them in a little case, throw yeah. them across the room and give them a timeout. Yeah, <laughs> just can't ever separate from it. So that mm -hmm. inextricable, and I know instrumentalists can they can have that sensation and feel that yeah. you know, as they funnel it's through. It's just not the same as housing your instrument. It's just and, no. and with all with all the trappings, all the pluses and all the minuses. And it's a broader picture, in my view, of and, and it sounds like the two of you have balance in your personal lives, so that right. your entire lives are not connected to what you do. And granted, what you do and who you are when you're an artist are very married, yeah. but to constantly maintain a balance. And that's also something. Yes. You help well, you, 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 that's a big focus. Let's big talk about that. The balance between private life and, and you know, your life on stage. How important it is, is it to both of you? Because that's a huge thing. I mean, Pat, you know, you're on stage a lot more now than, than Beth. And how do you balance that? For me, I, 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 I'm a pretty open book, but my private time and my is, is really very dear to me and very guarded. I remember we had friends over and they, they were in the industry, but they were people that I, you know, you let down. There's, you know, there's no, yeah. there's no the hat to wear. And they brought someone who is a, which we didn't know who is a massive, fan opera fan and I didn't know until after and I felt kind of betrayed because you know you let them into the inner sanctum right yeah you, know? say again? you let them into the inner sanctum you know you yeah and I I really it's not that I there's something that's so incredibly different but it's just uh, there's got to be a, a good chunk that's reserved for my private life well with any with any relationship a relationship is a series of agreements and you've achieved those agreements and right. that's true for your married lives if you're you know have a spouse it's true for your professional life when you're going to have your relationship with your director with your conductor with your colleagues 
with your costume designer, with, you know, the things, the way that we're Huge. going to inter, just to interrelate. Huge. And I, you know, it's like, we love entertaining in our home and we'll open it up, you know, for specific reasons. But if the agreement is we're doing it for an industry situation, then we're going to have that's a hat is on. That's, that's, the, that's, that's the hat that's, that's on. on. We'll still be authentic. Mm -hmm. It's that, but it's not that super personal thing. And, and you know, just like, and, and this is not a gender specific thing, although it's more common for those who identify as uh, female, but we have a brilliant friend. Her name is Dr. Nanette Gartrell. She's highly published. She's a wonderful psychiatrist. And one of the books she's written is my answer is no, if that's all right with you. <laughs> so what, even talking about what you're saying, one of the hard things to do in this industry is to say no, to say no to a job. Yes. Um, because, oh my gosh, then they won't hire me again or they won't think of that. And that can happen to people at the highest levels of all you, like, you yeah. know, people in that position or to say no to an interview, to say no to an after party, to say no to dinner with patrons who you know you know, have underwritten millions of dollars for an organization, you know, because right. you feel always beholden either to the, to the organization for, for whom you're singing in that moment or working, you yeah. know, yeah. you know. But I think young artists right now can learn a lot from this, this conversation. Oh my God. I mean, when I uh, heard that you work with some of the major young artist programs uh, in the Beth, United States, you mean. Um, excuse me, you mean Beth? Beth, yes, when you work with um, uh, some of the major young artist companies uh, in the US as well as I think I heard an orchestra or uh, orchestra Chicago or something like that. I, I thought, oh my God, if, if we had had access to this while I was in the middle of a young artist program, I mean, how different would I have thought about certain things that wouldn't have taken me so long to get there? I mean, listen, I'm a huge fan of mental health and therapy and get your heinies in there and talk it out. I learned early on that, yes, I have an amazing support foundation group of people around me, but there's also something that is so beautiful about talking to somebody outside of that circle that doesn't know all of the ins and outs of everything. And, um, and I'm so grateful that I learned that lesson early on, but to have someone who you can talk with that understands this business because that is crucial and very hard to find. So I'm so jealous of these kids that are getting to talk to you if they want to. I mean, this is freaking brilliant. Well, I appreciate you saying that. And, you know, as I've said to some of them, it's um, the important thing. And this, this isn't like to, to peddle my practice. It's not about that, but it can't be a one-off. It can't be just a single giant group session. That might be, you know, you can, you can get some interesting sort of caveats and make a certain, yeah. certain people who are not comfortable with a therapeutic, you know, forum at all. Mm -hmm. Maybe they'll get a few things that empower them. But I do still believe in terms of what I can offer, I think the one-on-one -on -one is still the most powerful because we also know, I mean, you, you don't wanna show your shit, as they say, in this business. You don't, even though you're, you're being asked to be an artist, not just a singer, you're being asked to be vulnerable. You're being asked to bring right. all of this palette of skills together and explode and do well and, and then not just be perfect, but say something, you know, and all of those things. And, and, you know, in a competitive, competitive business, no, you don't want to air say all your laundry in front of your I colleagues. wouldn't say a word. If I were in a group like, situation, I'd be like, nope. and, no, no, no. No. and now in the, in the digital age where everybody is videotaping everything, social media, thank you very much, I, my mouth would be glued shut. That's just yeah. one-on-one -on -one with the appropriate professional confidentiality and everything, but in a group situation, you don't want to, you know, it's just, it. I don't want to be sounding suspicious, but no. it doesn't feel safe. Right. And I've, I've addressed that. And we've sort of adjusted because during the pandemic, for when I was, you know, working with um, a couple of the young artist programs, that was a different, that was a little bit different need because they were, some of them were coming into the program for the first time. So they had no idea what it would have been like. Right. So separate sessions with them. And then some of the people who were returning, I had separate sessions with them. And then every, once in a while, then we would all meet together. And they yeah. all started, they're trying to form, you know, because you want to form rapport. Sure. But everybody rolls differently. Some people don't want to go to opera camp. They don't want to hang out with their colleagues all the time. Right. Right. Others thrive on it and can't function if they don't have that yeah. connection. So, I mean, it's just, it's interesting to, I know how often you say this word, I say it too, but just to give them permission to figure out what is it that works for you? Yes. How can yes. you optimize that and, and you know, solution focused brief therapy. One of the biggest things is like, how did you do that? Mm. Do more of that. 
<laughs> do, that. do more of it. Did mm -hmm. that not work? Don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, I know sometimes we just need people to tell us, duh, don't do that. You exactly. know, it, 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 it's and or or it's okay or it's not okay. We just need that because we have so many other people telling us what to do, how to do it, you know, and how we should act and all of that. And sometimes I think we get paralyzed. Yeah, I, I know I did in my well, career. That's very well said. That's and really it, true. And to get, you know, the, the essence of why most people go to seek therapy is because they're stuck, stuck mm -hmm. in something. Yeah. And, stuck in some, and maybe it's a mindset, maybe it's a physical paralysis because of all the external locus you're getting, you know. Well, yeah. The, I mean, let's even talk about that, the physical, the physicality of our roles and how, how grief or stress or all of that manifests in our body. Exactly. It's, and, and the thing is, what, what's also important about Beth's work and the fact that you uniquely bring to the table, you know what it's like to be, to, to have those boots on stage and yeah. you know, you know, both sides of that coin Literally. intricately, intricately. But what something that I do in in my work with young artists, both as a coach and director and whatever is, is, is fostering and encouraging and giving permission, finding that inner, that your, your, your true artistic voice. And as you said, Sandra, we're told it's incumbent upon any artist to entertain the ideas and, and interpretations of those around them. But I scream at them, do not come to the table without your own idea and fight for what you think. But this sort of balancing, this sort of vetting of mm, this doesn't feel right, why, you know, stop doing that, do that, whatever. That, that's why this is sort of such an important part of what it is to be an artist, of but, what it is to be a, a total artist, because you have to constantly take an unrelenting inventory emotionally in order to bring something potent to the stage. And you can't do that if you're not doing that in your own life. But, you're, but it's also about helping. It's not about me telling anybody what to do Ooh, or not no. to do. No, offering, helping them become their number one assessor. Yeah, so that yeah. you can always have your own barometer going. And like yeah. you know, we all know we've done a performance where I mean, I feel like, oh my god, that was pretty good. I think that was great. And then no one says, no one else right. says anything to you, or they might even say, oh, sorry, that didn't go quite as well as opening, right? Or right. you know, whatever. I you know, loved well. your act too. I mean, yes. that's your book. It's another book. <laughs> the things not to say. So yeah, like, that's it. That's it. Oh wait, uh, my, you know my least favorite is I know, and it's bit maybe picky, and but congratulations. One time I was so like on on fire. I said, like, "What? Am I pregnant?" And Beth had to siphon me away from the stage door because she could tell my filter was nowhere in sight. Well, you, I mean, listen, you are known for some really good retorts to. Okay. Um, Sorry, swallow. <laughs> I, I, I know not what you speak of. <laughs> to, some, to some people in the news, I think I think you are are kind of infamous for just telling them exactly what you feel. And I, Carrie and I both applaud you for that because how many times have we done interviews and you're like afterwards going, "Fuck you!" <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Like, well, one yeah. doesn't have to wonder. You know, I, I okay. like dying to ask this question. Can we go back, especially with you, Pat, working with young artists and being such an amazing um, singing actress? I'm trying to figure out how to ask this question. So I when my first Tosca, I went to Sandra and said, what, where are the pitfalls? How do I maneuver this to be able to act and sing this at the same time? Like, because as you said, act two is just like, Rah. you have all of those moments and then you got to stop and sing DC Dodd. Act three. But then you gotta go up to act three. You gotta go up to act three. So how do I maneuver this and still stay true to this acting thread of how I want to portray this on stage without sacrificing this or getting this in trouble? You also will right before VC Darte, you have those drums, and sometimes those conductors are conducting it so fast, and you're like, dude, I need a second. I gotta calm back down again. I just got attacked. So how do you teach, how, what is your process in separating that and then marrying it back together so make sure that you're vocally healthy throughout your performance? And how do you teach that to these young kids? Well, I think the first thing as someone who's working with a young artist or anyone is to sort of identify what, 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 what kind of artist are you? What, what, how, what are your, what is in your wheelhouse? What are your challenges? Um, for me, the marrying of it is it was essential to the singing of it. Mm -hmm. So, but there are some people, um, I remember having a 
it wasn't heated, but it was a tense conversation with Rene Papa, who said, who's so invested when he does stuff, but he believes that you have to keep the emotion out of it and separate it. So whatever works, it works for him. I would never, I, that would destroy me. To right. Do so it's identifying, okay, this person, what is really, you know, I had a few young artists this past um, summer that, that I could tell, okay, this is, this is their exit portal to get their juice out there. Okay. This is how they're going to do it. And then some literally needed to keep that separate. So it's really dealing with the individual and how to do that. And it sounds like for you, you're saying it's, and I totally feel the pain of the VC Darte coming out of nowhere, you know, and, and after, after such a visceral physical yes. vocal experience and, um, uh, I mean, it's it's really a matter of of figuring out what what unlocks um, you vocally, what unlocks you interpretively. Mm -hmm. And I say this all the time, with all due respect to con artists, but we're con artists. I said it may be very difficult. It yes, there are red flags vocally in every role for everyone at right. some point. I really believe that. Right. Don't let us know out here. Thank you. <laughs> Just, you don't, and so you find a way to as cleverly and artistically yeah. and interpretively and um, nuanced as possible to disguise those moments that are a reality. This is a vocal moment. And like Sandra, you said, Act 3, somehow, how am I going to get my larynx out of my forehead you and back it. into my throat? Things like that. And, th and there are, there, I mean, uh, we all, the over-prioritization is what I'm noticing in working with people, even with con in conservatories and young artist program mm -hmm. is, yes, we have to command the technique. We have to command the voice. But the over-prioritization of that is leaving free the interpretive, the nurturing and fostering of the interpretive process. It leaves out the possibility for attaching individuality to it. It leaves out the possibility of finding these solutions. People are not rehearsing performance. They're rehearsing the voice. They're rehe and it's just, it's in my opinion, it's a little too late to rehearse the performance of what it is to be an artist once yeah. you're in the room with the conductor and the director. And That's all even what we're talking about though. And in, my, in, the, in the work I like to do and the work that, you know, I think we all, it sort of becomes a collective. Right. It's about allowing that fluidity. I mean, think about if, if our joints work, we still have synovial fluid in them. You know, if most our joints them, get, yes, most, most of them, them most some of us are, you know, <laughs> But, Some of us are a little older, you know, so they're a little creepy sometimes, but you want that fluidity. If we've become so tight with all the requirements, all the prioritization you're saying of all the things that are necessary, mm -hmm. then you're squeezed out quite literally. And then when you start to feel that in your mind, then your voice follows, you know, and the larynx is going to grip because we know that the, we know in our, in our brains, we know that the best singing is going to happen when this is just uninvolved and just hanging out. Yeah. And so there are all, also those little tricks you, you teach people, whether it's a con artist moment, but you know, yes. how, how in therapy, you know, they're always saying, you know, take one, close one nostril and breathe out this side, hold it, and then release down mm -hmm. the other side. Well, we were talking with our teacher the other day with Trish, and she was reminding, she was like, she said, no, like, also, if you do that, just think about it. Touch you your take, larynx. When you breathe in your through your nose, your larynx goes, mm -hmm. It's if true. You put your tongue in the perfect position for singing. It's like, it's not lifting your tongue. Yeah. It's not really doing, but it just kind of lets it go, hey, you know, just like a baby. So yeah. all these kind of things, like, you know, you're, you've just fit, you're just about, you're hearing the drums for VC Dottope. And maybe, I mean, you know, no way it's going to know. I, you know what? Somebody else told me, a, a very famous singer told me, if you have a difficult run or a difficult phrase, put a movement in with it. Yes, it's physical. I also have to remind young artists all the time. You know what we do in life? We tilt our heads. We blow, right. Follow. We look. Something. Down. You know, like it's something easy. to to not go to, to not freeze up to allow things to be supple and responsive and yes. supportive and the right sort of physical antagonism that a body must have between tension and release. Bingo. So I mean, it's all that. But it, it, uh, for me, attaching it to something interpretive is yeah. always the key. And I think it, it, even musical markings, stylistic yeah. things, it don't just do a pianissimo because it says that, make it mean something. And right. as soon as you attach it to something emotional um, or interpretive, it, it takes on an ownership and a dimensionality. That's not a word, but it now is. It is, it's in the dictionary. Is it? Yeah, I've used that one too.
I'll well, take good. Inectically? Inectically. That's my new word. And then oh, you know I know the new word I made. Diagonality. 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 Anyway, let's see We're going right. to call these pandemic words. <laughs> <laughs> that really is a thing. Excuse, they came out today. I just read this to Duncan, actually. And they came out with some words. Zappy? Do you know what Zappy is? Never heard of it. It's a man who is well-dressed and very chic. Zappy. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Never heard of it. And y'all and yuns is now in the dictionary. Well, that should be. That yeah. should. I'm sorry. Y'all. I mean. So let's, okay, let's talk about you, Pat. Again, sorry, Beth. One of my favorite subjects. You are, Aww, you, are sweet you are Tra Your transition from singing to, oh, baby, singing to directing, to teaching voice, to now being the head of the Young Artist Program at Opera Theater of St. Louis, am I correct? That's correct. That's correct. That's a, that's a huge swing. How did that happen? It, and it, it, it happened. It happened naturally. Well, first of all, I mean, I am still singing, but it's a very short and small list of roles that I wish to do. Sure. Um, you know, any singer knows in their life, uh, professionally, any sane singer should know that, you know, it's not about if it ever come winds down or comes to a close, but it's when, and what do you want your life to look like? I mean, there, there was so much, my schedule, when I look back at my schedule, you know, some years ago, it was so intense. And frankly, and honestly, I hit a wall. I, I became saturated. You know this, Sandra, doing lady, la leading lady roles, you know, for 33 years, as much as I loved almost every minute of it, it was, it just, it, it, it takes something, and it doesn't take something. It drains you in a very specific, um, intense way. You know my... Um, I mean, the joke was I've always been directing, even when I've been singing. Um, so, I mean, so it's something, what I love about directing is not just being sort of in charge of the narrative of the entire story of the entire evening, but I, I've never was able to mind my own business in, in a role, doing a role, you know. Well said, well said. I, yeah. I, you have to be mono-minded when you're doing a role, but I'd be always like, you know, it would look so much better if those chairs were diagonal over there, and then the director would take <laughs> or, it off. You know, if you didn't stat, you know, if we did, if you didn't die like that, Scarpia, you know, if you died like that, and yeah, <laughs> I was just yeah, I just I, so I it was hard for me to mind my own business, and as a director, we have full permission to th that is your business to mind everybody to, to mind business. everyone's business. So I love that, and I love drawing out from the ingredients, the singers, their performances, and then having that. Um, everyone worked from the same gesticular palette, if you will, so that it really, because yeah. I find it very disturbing when you're, when you're performing and you have these different styles, you have the park and barker, you have the person riding and rolling around on the ground. And, and I think it is the responsibility of the director to make sure that that has one cohesive thing. I digress. So the transition, the transition was natural in that regard. James Robinson approached me some years ago. I said, Hey, I know you're still singing and everything, but what do you think about directing? And I, you know, I said, it's been on my mind for some time. So um, Opera Theatre of St. Louis actually afforded me my directorial debut doing La Traviata, which- um, In 2018. In 2018, which I, I loved doing it, loved, you know, it was interesting. I got, I did many interviews and the question almost across the board was, well, you've done Violetta so often. Isn't it difficult to have someone else do it? I said, the fact that I've done Violetta as, is, has no bearing whatsoever. I said, I'm dealing with the ingredients before me. I'm dealing with the singer before me. I have happened to know the score intimately well. That's just gonna aid me in the timing and the, the everything um, for that. So that was a natural progression and something that I, I truly enjoyed. Although the curtain call is nothing compared <laughs> to being a leading lady, just FYI. And no, and then, and then they left. <laughs> yeah. 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 I can't see the center. I, I can't see the center. <laughs> but, um, but then, it, oh, honestly, it, it doesn't matter. I knew that I didn't want to, and I don't mean this with total respect, but I didn't want to just teach voice. 
That's not where my mind and my ears go. I work totally with the stuff. I can't get away from the linguistic stuff, the stylistic stuff and the vocal stuff and the interpretive stuff. So I would call it more a coach that deals, you know, also vocally. So You're that- an integrative stuff. artist. Integrative yes, artistry. integrative. And my seminar, integrative artistry that I've done oh, um, several, yes. pla several places. I that. that. At there several conservatory and Washington. WNO and Juilliard and everything. And really being able to deal with that and do that, that sort of started happening just naturally. It just sort of fell in my lap. And I'm a big planner. But really when I look back, if I were to hit rewind, the stuff that I was really thinking I might plan, they're over there. The stuff that happened to me is what sort of plopped on my lap. Then in 19, I was here singing Crystal Nitschka. Andrew Jorgensen called me and said, would you like, we'd like to have you be uh, the artistic director for the Young Artist Program. A position they've never had before. Yeah, that's not officially. a position that exists oh, for TSL. Right. Um, so I said yes, and it, it sort of, it, it made sense with the work I had been doing with integrative artistry. It's sort of, it, it's sort of a more elaborate, more involved um, ex expression of that in my desire to foster and curate our next generation of artists. And, you know, so that the transition has been really pretty natural, pretty natural and, and, and really seamless in, in yeah. that regard. Yeah. So it's, it's it both gives you, it gives you fuel for realizing like some of your natural capacities that didn't necessarily get used yeah. in, in doing leading lady parts and, and being that person and, and being, you know, being the performer. I mean, it, it also gives you, gives one pause and reinvigorates your um, admiration, your, you know, your respect for everybody, for both of you, for anybody who, for any of us who have stood mm -hmm. up and done that, because mm -hmm. you realize the pressure is so different. Yeah. Like the pressure, it's a pressure cooker for directing in a different way in terms of time and responsibility. But once you can let it go and you can, there's some directors who can't let it go very easily, but you, you, you were able to pretty, yeah I just said pretty, pretty much do that. but um no it's true but, but it's it's the thing I found out I'm really I'm like time management I I mean I'm like so that's okay. something that gets a really fully realized and is necessary as a director thank a you that I is my biggest pet peeve with directors yes is that um, they waste our time yes oh and there, none of that ever happened hola, and I, hola. I was, you know, even though I hadn't directed before, I didn't, I did, I planned it perfectly. I, I wasn't, I didn't run out of time. I knew exactly the time I had and what needed to happen. I, you know, in working with the, my design team earlier on, it was very clear to me, my vision of what I wanted. And I articulated to the best of my ability, how we can bring that to fruition. All these things, they just, they're part of my personality that were able to be more utilized perhaps than um, just, realizing the you know leading lady or whatever so that that all just sort of unfolded naturally and this past um, summer i also sang love while you men but i in 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 at opera theater st louis so i was wearing three hats because i directed myself and that was the first i was supposed to be directing myself in love while you men in dallas but pandemic canceled so i directed myself um i was also artistic director for the young artists and so i was also singing so it was a very very busy hat wearing beth I said to Andrew, look, I, I need my eyes and ears out there. I need, you know, someone I know and I can trust. And, and so Beth was brought on as creative consultant. So what happened is, as I realized how I wanted to stage it, especially once we got things a little more concretized, Beth would record it on my iPad. Okay. So I would go through it, I'd go home and I'd scream at the soprano. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> and things of that nature. So it was, it was, it was an interesting experience. I have a feeling it might have been a little bit more R-rated, but <laughs> <laughs> it, it was. I mean, that was fun for me too. I mean, a, I did not want to be an assistant director, um, primarily because I also didn't want to take a job from a young person who's starting out and they right. need that job. Yeah. And so, but it gave me permission to be in the room and to do the things I always do except they're usually in the dark of the night. Covert, you know, the covert right. things that you know, I'm usually always a part of, but both her learning Beth process. and I are a team. And we, we work, I, I, mean, I worked it with Beth here, with Beth playing at the piano. We're, we're a team. Beth can almost play the score now. <laughs> well, people what? don't know that about you, that Beth, Beth is, even even when you were singing Beth, I knew this, like you, you are expert at coaching, at playing the piano. You're really good with languages. 
And I know that you've worked with Pat on a lot of roles. And I mean, perfect. It's, it's like you two are the perfect. We, we approach our lives personally and professionally very much as a team. And, and I mean, she's going to be absolutely, I'm going to be leaning hard, you know, for her to help me get my voice back into shape as I, you know, come out. And even though it's not, not a super demanding role, it's, it's singing and it's in public. Yeah. And so yeah, well, I, I'm I mean, about that, to work on that part of the process again. It's like, we're all going through it. Carrie, Carrie is doing her first, uh, job back in September, right? Yeah, September. And it's like, I, you know, when we interviewed Renee, she was like, this has been hard for me because I'm a deadline person. And I can res I resonate with that because if you give me a deadline, then I map it out. I like you, I'm a planner. I've got, it's like plan A, type A personality with planning. So I've got to do this, 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 and this to get here. But without that deadline, it's a, feels really weird. And when a manager is like, hey, you better get your stuff together because there might be fill-ins here, blah, 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 blah. You're like, eh, yeah, whatever. <laughs> I know. I spent months. So I didn't sing a note. And I was like, Ooh, what, what, what? what? you can't do that after, you know, it's tricky. No, I mean, that part is tricky. And again, you know, like talking to people, it's like, like everything else that becomes cyclical. I mean, now we know more about the pandemic, you know, every day we know something different. So now we look back and now we sort of clock it from March of 2020 and right. even though it was probably December of 2019 or, or whatever. Right. Or looking at how we, reacted in the in the early months and then how that had to take on a subtle like had to plateau just like everything else and then you just kind of have to be in it and some of the things that felt almost even maybe not exciting but felt okay well this is new and different we can do this for a couple of yeah. weeks a couple of months a couple oh god this might oh, be crap years. right so you have to keep reprocessing that and creating those for a type a people have to have to create deadlines for themselves even if it's things that are you know pulling out of thin air mm -hmm. but, but we do that we know we're all our CEOs, CFOs, CEO. I mean, we have to be that person. Yes. I mean, we've always said singing is a sport. We know it's a sport. And so yes. this is this has been a very like visceral reminder of what it's like to be an elite athlete. Mm -hmm. And they there is no there is no break in their training that's mm -hmm. not one hundred percent intentional or due to an injury. No. No, so, but even you know, even athletes during the pandemic were struggling because I mean, not because, okay, now I can't get into gym, so I'm still going to do this workout, but it's still not the same. It's like us, you know, where we we're all of a sudden we are on our booties in the house on zooms or computers for hours where we're normally running around like crazy people. So and they uh, were fly fishing, Carrie. Oh, excuse me. Oh, you were. Oh, wait, do you guys ever go whitewater rafting? I did that in Santa Fe and had a blast. I've never done it. You've done it. Have I've said it as a youth. When you were, you when I was at, but a youth, you in Santa Fe. Okay. Awesome. I got another question to ask, and 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 this is a big one, so be ready. Carrie's like, yeah, oh my God. but uh, no, it's a see, yeah, have a swig. It's a serious one, and 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 I think, yeah, there you go, share. Um, Gross. I think the opera world. Carrie and I both agree. I'll speak for myself, but I think the opera world has been stuck in a very antiquated rhythm and form. And I think that this pandemic has really brought about an awakening for our art form, for the LGBTQ, for diversity. And I know we haven't talked anything about this, but how do you guys feel like you can contribute to this, be a part of it? Or do you feel that it's not your place to, you know, contribute to the change of the opera world? Honestly, there's part of me that says, or do you think that it's all lip service? Because that's the conversation yes. I'm having right now is like, was this all lip service? You know, the BLM movement, the, I mean, having everybody of everybody of all sizes. I mean, do you think that this is just bullshit? No, I don't. I think, I think this whole movement finally has had impact on our world and yes, on our, our profession. Okay. I, I can speak for Opera Theater of St. Louis. The EDI is front and center. There is just no more where Andrew Jorgensen, our general director said, no more all white casts, period. We're not doing that. Now, um, you know, I mean, in terms of the LBGTQ, Beth and I have been- That has a little bit of dyslexia. I don't did know. I say it wrong? Did, but, I, yeah. did I say yeah. LGBTQ. LGBTQ? Bacon, lettuce, and tomato. Right. Um, <laughs> you know, what is L? G. L. That's all. Anyway, but it, in terms of in terms of 
Diversity. Let's Diversity just Diversity and everything. Beth and I have been out. Remember my 2002 cover, we oh, came out in print. And before then, I had been asked in interviews, and I would say, um, I, you know, I'd rather not, I'd rather not discuss that or something. Not that I was personally closeted at any point, mm -hmm. but then I realized that makes me sound ashamed. That mm -hmm. makes me, and I, I thought, why would I be ashamed of, you know, the most important and the best aspect of my life? Mm -hmm. So it, it was that. And also I got asked by, or mentioned to me by colleagues, you know, gosh, I hope that didn't hurt your career. The fact is I said, I don't know if it hurt my career. I don't know what roles I've been passed over for. I don't know. We never know these things. Right. And I would, I would actually say, no, I don't think it hurt my career, but we, we came out and we've, we've taken every opportunity um, given to us within, you know, within reason to put ourselves out there and to be out and proud and to be examples. And, and, you know, that the, it's, it gets better. Did I get that right? Yes, well, listen, I mean, Michael Fabiano, we interviewed him and Michael Fabiano was told to keep his mouth shut mm -hmm. about, about being gay by, and, uh, by a lot of people in the business, his voice teacher, people in the business, his manager. And at some point he just said, nope. it, it, it started to. Yes. Yes. And, uh, what I said in this article and I still believe, and I say every time I'm asked is if you're really going to be an authentic, potent artist, you have to be true to who you are and what you bring to the table. There was some very famous person that is homosexual that um, said to me early on, you know, that's just, I think, you know, the same advice Michael got, you know, just keep it quiet, keep it quiet. And then once those of us that took the risk and that were on the edge of that blade mm -hmm. came out and proud and enjoyed the the spoils of what we actually created and those before us, well, those we, before yeah, us. Those, without question, those before us, but it, yes, it's, it is living on the edge. Yes, it is taking a risk. It mm -hmm. is, it is that thankfully less so now, but I mean, we had mm -hmm. friends that at our wedding that had been married for almost 50 years and they each married um, a person of the opposite sex and the full, they were two couples, but they were same sex couples. But they were, you know, this is back in what? They lived in New Orleans and what, just lived. 19. Lived no. alive. Yeah, but so this, those that have helped clear the way is, is you know, they have to be acknowledged. And, and, and I think, I think it's, it's, it is everyone, has, it's their own choice, but everyone has to make that choice. But I think it is important not to behave as though you are ashamed of something you are not. And but, the silence but, can be that. Absolutely. But to your point, is it going to stick? in this particular pandemic thing. Zoe says, maybe. Zoe, wait. Uh, yeah. I, you know, that that's the question I, because did I love what I was seeing online from com opera companies, like waking up or how, whatever verbiage you want to use with that. But then part of me is just kind of holding my breath. I'm wondering, are we, am, am I going to be able to be in a rehearsal room and not feel like I'm objectified or not feel like I'm not safe or, you know what I mean? Those kinds of things. Am I going to be in a rehearsal room where I see the rainbow? Am I going to be in a rainbow, not of, of colors, but of sizes? Am I just going to see our world reflected on this stage? I, and, think, um, I hope so. I, and I think, you know, a lot of that, it does have to do, we're still in a cast system with cast with an E. And so I think it's really important that that people who are at the very tippity top of our business speak out and you know live their live their own truths. And there are more people doing that, who, whether it's LGBTQ or whether it's people of color. So the whole BIPOC situation and mm -hmm. you know, and us learning, we we are learning. It's not just the lip service, but we have to have increased our vocabularies, and we have. Like when I was doing my degree, I had I didn't know that I was a cisgendered female until I was doing that. I okay. had to learn what cisgendered really was. Yeah. It was like to learn about marginalization. What are your marginalizations? Well, mine is I'm a female and then I'm a lesbian. Mm -hmm. and, and then how you combat that. And how, who is the least marginalized, you know, human walking around? Well, it's a white male. Mm -hmm. And so, but then that doesn't mean white males are bad. Right. No. <laughs> you know, no, like, I, I think the pendulum needs to, I think we need to. And, kind of come to a happy medium, but I'm glad that the pendulum is swinging. We, yeah. both, we all are. I mean, it needed to change. Opera needed to change. Without, without question. And, and you know, my, my hope is, you know, it, it has to happen on many levels. It can't just be like, you know, 
casting with diversity right. in mind. It also has to be about outreach. About outreach. Yes. As an artistic director for a young artist program, I need to find out why so few people of color auditioned for us. Right. So my vet, my colleague Yvette Loinas and I are figuring out ways that we can we can get to the bottom of that answer and make those opportunities available. Yes. Or make people aware go, of them. Go to universities so really, that are primarily people of color. Because none of us go want to... diversity for diversity's sake in, in, in place of excellence. I don't think anyone of color would want to be chosen just because they're of color. They want to be chosen on the criteria and their their, their abilities within as an artist as well. As but, but that's why that. we're going to have a question. Our society is going to question that for a little bit longer yeah. because it's mm -hmm. the swing. Mm -hmm. Like you're saying, Sandra, and it's, you know, it's going to, it's going to take some catch up. There's yep. a lot of catch up and a lot. Ketchup. Yeah, I know you love catch up. But, um, we're going to do it with a C. And I want to see the best person. We all want to see the best person for yeah. the job, no matter what they look like, no matter a everything. We just want to hear the best voice or conductor or instrumentalist or dancer or whatever for the job. I don't but care what start, But it does start much earlier because that does, it's the trickle down, you yeah. know, trickle backwards theory. What opportunities made it more possible for somebody to have voice lessons at age 13 instead yeah, of saying it's the trickle I'm up. 20 and the trickle up. We need to trickle up. And, you know, I'm sorry. I know we're not ever, ever supposed to talk about politics, but the person that was in the White House previously, oh, person, oh, let me do that, um, that was in the White House <laughs> previously uh, gave permission yes. for intolerance and hate. Hate. At a level that I find still staggering, and I think this this the, the BLM movement has really landed. Things are definitely different. What yeah. we're all saying is, please don't evaporate. Don't Thank, yes, and that's that's really the whole point of my question and and my worry and my hope. My worry that it's not just lip service bullshit, whatever. I that it in the corner, I really believe that, and I think some of the things that have evolved in the pandemic, some of the like just like a pop-up shop has evolved, you know, for retail, these pop-up operas or the pop, you know, the operas that are going to be done in offsite venues are strange, you know, like Opera Philadelphia has been doing that for years. Now it's a thing. Right. So these smaller little kind of jewel opera companies are mm -hmm. going to do more cutting edge things. No, they're not going to be able to do an Aida anytime soon, but leave that to somebody else that let, yeah. let everything kind of redistribute. And I don't think it's going to swing back to one side where it's only about grand opera and it is going to be about telling the other stories and they're being told. Yeah. So the operas are being written. They're happening as we speak and they have been. I mean, that fire shut up in my bones is right. going to open the Met. Look at that. Right. I mean, that's yeah. amazing. Amazing. Uh, amazing. Let, let us pray black, that that opens. It's a director and it's a, a black woman. I know. With, with, with Jim. With, with Jim, Jim Robinson. Yeah. And I mean, I think that's why I think this BLM thing, it, this, it is landed and people are saying, whoa, 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 stop. Let's rethink. And, and so it's in, in for people of color, for females, um, you know, I, so I just, you know, we'll. Oh, that's what we say. Oh, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So shall we do, do you guys have five more minutes? We do have five more minutes. We have five more minutes, mm -hmm. yes. Have five more minutes. Okay, we do rapid fire. So we do these very funny, I know. Pat, Prepare yourself. Pat, Pat's not, uh, yeah. Sorry, Pat. I know you are a bit of a perfectionist. I know you and you're like, okay. Shall we start? Can I start? Fun. This is fun. Yeah, go ahead. Can we start with Pat. Okay. What did you want to be as a child? Police officer. <laughs> Best answer ever. <laughs> I went through a little depression when I found out I was too old to join the force. Another story. Okay. <laughs> oh man, why didn't we talk about this on the Diva? C part two is coming, people. Part two. <laughs> I've, done, I've said that in the minute. Oh, so I see that goes back to the Fanchula and the gun. Gotcha. Thank you. Beth, what is the worst gift you have given your other half sitting right next to you? Oh, um, I don't know. It may have been the worst, but it was also the best thing ever. A little plastic keyboard. Yeah, my little plastic, plastic keyboard. Oh, the roll up one? Yeah. No, no, no. The older. No. So, okay. Circa 1980s. Okay. Yeah. 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 okay, Pat, what's the strangest thing that you know too much about? Either of us? No, she said to me. No, well, the thing I know too much about. It could be either of you, I guess, but. Um, how to repair a roof. 
I do. I make. I do our own roof repairs. Um, so that, and I also know a lot about chainsaws. I'll send you two photos after this. Um, I have three chainsaws. We, we get up on the roof. I, do you have a gator? Do you guys know what a gator is? Wait, yes. Wait. Aside what is from it? the, it's it's the kind that has. It, it's like a female chainsaw. You know, it has like little guards on it, so you can cut something about that big. No. I did get her a lady chainsaw. I got a lady to chainsaw. The whole situation. But I needed something. We've got two more now. Yes. But mine is the giant. I have one too, so I'm 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 in the game. Yes. But mine's the giant pole saw because you know I can extend. I can. I know. Get eight, eight, eighteen yeah. feet up. So yeah. You know, you know, yeah. We have this ridiculous quote to 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 put this um, elastomeric membrane on the roof. Ridiculous amount of money during the pandemic, and I thought I've got time. Went spent a couple hundred dollars on the stuff. We did it. Fixed it myself. So anyway, so that's way too much about it and about no. it. Okay. okay, you guys are like like blowing my mind because I thought I was a badass with the power washer, but now I'm finding out that you all have chainsaws. I need to go downstairs and tell my husband, Bebe, I need a chainsaw. I gotta be a badass like these Baby, ladies. I told you you could play with the gator when you came up to the house, but you didn't want it. So. Yeah, to me, and the power washer there because I'm sort of addicted to vacuuming. I love to vacuum. And so that's my outdoor vacuum. Except oh, I try okay. to use it judiciously yes. because we live the in the water, the desert, desert and the whole thing. Oh yeah, that's Even your and Rufus Wainwright's husband. He loves to vacuum. Mm. Just saying. Daily. Okay, Beth, what song always gets stuck in your head? Oh God, glitter and be gay. <laughs> that's horrible. That's oh. horrible. I'm so sorry. <laughs> that is god awful. Okay, Pat, best wardrobe malfunction that you've had singing. I feel like that needs to go to both of you. That is yeah. a both, per, yeah. both person. Hey, Zalame, Metropolitan Opera. The, of course, I'm, I'm a buxom lady. So um, after the, the, the reveal, there was a quick thing that we had to have a special bra with a hook that's about this big and a thing that goes into it. And so it was really quick that the, uh, the person had to hook it up. It didn't clasp! <laughs> Did you do the full Monty? Oh, I did the full Monty, but I was then both, but I had, uh, there was more movement involved. The full Monty happens and you're still, but then there's movement involved and I didn't want anything seismic happening. So I had, a, I had a, to put on a bra. So I literally, I'm singing the, the, the whole last bit of it, which is a ball buster sort of with my biceps and arms making sure I can so you're to That was a big- To be your own human bra. Exactly. Yes. exactly. That was a pretty big malfunction. Oh dear! Oh dear! I okay, would have Karen. died. I'm sorry. I had to pull Karen, my underwear died. backwards, and it was—it was, it was just not a good not underwear a good, day. Not a good day. I mean, do you have one? Well, it's not necessarily a costume malfunction. I just remember in um, a Carmen Act Four that used real horses and a real carriage, and the and the horse. And the horses just—they brought us on, and they took us off. <laughs> there was no, there was no CT. No, no, we're no. off, and we're gone. <laughs> CT. I'm, I'm coming. I'm coming. <laughs> yeah, Mary, favorite question? Oh, no, I'm Do sorry. It. Like, I feel like horses just should never be on stage. I the one time I had a horse, he pooed. I didn't know he pooed. It was Boca Negra. I came out to sing the aria, and then the instructor wanted me down on the ground. This is we're in rehearsal. Thank God we're in rehearsal or down on the ground. I've got my bracelets on, and all of a sudden I, you know, I get up on the ground. I'm like, why do I still smell poo? Why do I still smell poo? And it's like poo and the jewelry poo. Oh and no! They thought that they had gotten it. All. It's dark, you know. They thought that they had gotten it and cleaned it all, but like there's still like the skid. Oh. Like, why, Lord? Why? 246 not to sing Simon Bocanegra. <laughs> Okay, Carrie, favorite question. You have to ask it. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. Um, what is your favorite cuss word in any language to both of you? I mean, do, 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 cuss in other languages, do you? It can be in any language. It can be in English. Whatever. Fuck balls. What? Fuck balls. <laughs> Fuck is 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 notoriously the fame. Fucker yeah. motherfucker is yeah. the famous swear word on our but, show. But fuck balls is kind of brilliant. That makes oh, me laugh. Cool. I think I'm just gonna say that around my house for the next week just to make myself laugh. <laughs> that in the dictionary now. Balls. Fuck balls. It's that yeah with a southern accent. Balls. Fuck balls. Oh, okay. Last question. Last oh, question. Wait. Sandra. Sandra. Yeah. Beth has not answered the question. Um. 
Well, I, I, I polluted Beth with bad language. You never cussed before. I know. So, and I know. Now That's why I segued. Because Beth didn't want to answer it. See, I'm trying to be a good hostess. I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I got to know the cuss word. What do you use when you just got to say something? Crap. I'm a big, you know, I mean, I say shit balls a lot. I mean, it's not the ball. Ironically. <laughs> a double ball answer in a lesbian household. Exactly. What's happening? We're ball free. What's happening? Right. Yes. I didn't know what's happening. <laughs> okay, last question for both of you. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you walk through the pearly gates? Oh my God, that warranted some contemplation. I know. Well, should we let Beth answer first then? Yeah. <laughs> hmm. You know, I've been waiting for you. <laughs> what? what <laughs> please repeat the question. <laughs> if heaven if exists. Heaven exists what can you want to hear God say as you walk through the pearly gates? I know what you said. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. I Go told you I was a woman. <laughs> I wasn't going to say that, but I'm totally stealing it and taking it. I, I love that. I love that. Oh, dear. That's yeah. fabulous. Yeah. We love it. We love both of you. Thank you so much for your time. Absolutely. Sure. This was fun. This was Yay. really fun. Love you both. Stay Bye. well. Okay? Much love to you both. Bye. Bye. Bye.